We should be live. Hello, Facebook world. Looks like it's loading if you can't hear me. Uh, we are going to get started here in about one minute. Uh, we're really lucky to have a special guest, Mike Ottoman from Washington Fish and Wildlife is here to talk to us all about our topic for today. So we'll get started in one minute and we're hoping that you guys are going to be around to ask questions. So we'll be right back. All right, we are back. Um, those of you that are popping on right now, I'm so happy to see all of you guys. I hope you have a had have a happy New Year so far. Uh, the sun is out today, which makes me joyful and happy. Um, we are going to have a very unique experience today. We actually have a live guest, so I don't have to do all the talking. Um, our guest speaker is Mike Atoneman. He is a wildlife biologist with Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife. Uh, before we hand it over to him, we want to give you a quick recap of all the stuff we've been talking about this week on our Facebooks and Instagram pages leading up to Mike's talk. Um, so we talked about a critter called the sage grouse. Um, Mike's going to go into this more, but the sage grouse is a bird found in Washington, the western Washington United States. Uh, they're larger than a chicken, but smaller than a turkey. And I don't know if you guys know how big a chicken is. They can be about that big and turkeys can be about that big. Um, but they're somewhere in the middle of that. And they eat mostly sagebrush, especially during the winter. Uh, if you can imagine what sagebrush looks like, um, we're going to show you here in a picture in a second. Uh, you guys might see this as you're driving towards Seattle, maybe on I-90. It's very common through this area of the country. It's kind of bluish and greenish and gray in color. Um, I, my kids are always like, oh, it's so boring driving to Seattle because it's ugly. And, but it's actually a really cool ecosystem. Uh, if it's in the summertime out, you might have your windows down and smell a very distinct smell. And it can be used for a lot of things, weaving baskets or clothes. Um, and as one of our Facebook followers comments, the bark can be even made into a pen. So thanks for providing that information. Uh, I know people will use it. They'll burn it and smudge their house when they want to get rid of any bad uh, vibes going on, or maybe just increase a cool smell in their house. Uh, Sagebrush keeps its leaves all winter, and that makes it a really good re uh, food source for animals during winter months. Um, and Mike, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but some, study, some studies have shown that sagebrush can make up 100% of a sage grouse diet during the winter. So this would be the only thing they eat might be hard for you guys to think about eating the same thing over and over again every day for the winter, unless it's pizza, maybe that works. A term that you'll probably hear today is shrub step. Uh, step is S-T-E-P-P-E. -P -P -E. It refers to an area that sagebrush and animal, these animals live in. Uh, shrub step is a type of habitat. Shrub step is higher in elevation and it's pretty dry. Uh, because it's dry, the shrub step habitat it is very prone to wildfires. Sagebrush can be very dry and easily flammable. The smallest spark can light a whole area on fire. And as you can see in the bottom right picture, it's after the fire at Swanson's Lake. And we're going to talk about that more today with Mike. Uh, these fires burn hot and fast and leaves the area completely bare. As humans, it is our responsibility to prevent wildfires and be fire safe, especially in summer months and these habitats. 
so that's kind of recaps everything we've been talking to you about this week. But we're going to talk to Mike now. Um, and we're going to turn it over to Mike, and he's going to do some talking. We have some pre-recorded questions that people have given us from Facebook's live or uh, post. But if you guys have anything you're curious about, please let me know. Um, Mike, I really first am going to ask you, what does a wildlife biologist do? And we're going to get you on the big screen here so everyone can see your awesome face. And those of you, Mike is not sitting out in the middle of a shrub step habitat. Uh, he is, oh, it's on the right hand. Keep going right. Right now you're a tiny little person on our screen. I don't want him to do I think I'll, maybe I'll sneak in there. <laughs> You guys talk amongst yourselves. Uh, <laughs> we're trying to figure out how to make you bigger, Mike. It's okay. Can they hear me? or? Yeah, they can hear you. Go ahead and start talking. Okay. So, yeah, what is a wildlife biologist? So that, that's a pretty wide field, actually, when you say wildlife biologist. Uh, wildlife biologists can work on a, a, a very wide breadth of animals, typically. Uh, but they also will often work with ecosystems and habitat as well. So wildlife biologists can be very focused on a specific animal and spend all their lives working on one specific animal. Or like myself, I'm a wildlife, I'm a district wildlife biologist for the Washington State Department of Fish and Wildlife, which means I work on a wide variety of animals for for the state. I cover Spokane, Lincoln, and Whitney counties in Washington State for. Pretty much everything that's not a fish. I literally work on everything from butterflies to moose. So I'm what you'd call more of a generalist in the wildlife biology field. Um, but you get people that spend, like I said, their whole life working on a specific animal um, or on specific habitat. Uh, from step, as uh, Jamie mentioned earlier, is one of those ecosystems that some people spend their whole life working on and in that one habitat type and working on a variety of animals within it. So. Um, yeah, and you can work anywhere from you're in the field 24-7, sometimes as a wildlife biologist, and then there's other wildlife biologists that do a lot of their work from behind a computer desk because they're working more on spatial data, um, data taken to cover wide swaths of habitat and doing more spatial monitoring. So again, it, it, it's, it's a pretty wide field and there's a lot of diversity in it, um, something for almost anybody to work on in that field. Mike, how did you decide you wanted to be a wildlife biologist? Um, a mixture of several things kind of brought it about to me being a wildlife biologist. I, I knew I wanted to work outdoors more as I grew up. I, I grew up in Southern California, which meant getting outdoors was a little bit more work than, than typical than you would have here in Spokane. Um, but my dad and my brother and my mother and my sister, we'd all go camping every summer. So I enjoyed the camping. I enjoyed being outside. And I knew that after years of doing that as a younger it, that when I went to college, I wanted to work outside. And then I kind of found my way into the wildlife field as an undergrad at UC Davis. So that's University of California, Davis, there in the Central Valley. I got my bachelor's in wildlife biology there. Um, and after, uh, after I got done with my bachelor's, I worked out in the field on various different projects. And eventually I decided that I wanted to have a little bit more of a stable job, um, which meant going back to school. And I went back and got my master's degree at the University of Nevada, Reno, uh, working on sage grouse, actually in eastern Nevada. I did my master's work on, on sage grouse out there. And then after I finished up uh, with my master's, I was lucky enough to get a job with the Washington State Department of Fish and Wildlife up here in Spokane. And I've been here since for the last about 13 years. I've been in Spokane working on sage grouse out in Lincoln County. But again, like I said, working on monarch butterflies and trying to Trying to help them out, uh, working on moose, working on a whole wide variety of species. Awesome. So, do you would you say that you have to get a four year degree to get a job at Fish and Wildlife? Are there two year degrees or college or high school graduate type occupations? I think kids like to know the the various choices. Yeah. So it, it's if you get just a, a high school degree or a two year degree, um, you, you can get work. But typically, that work is not as um, not as well paying, and it's it's also not typically uh, permanent type of positions. It's more seasonal work. Um, 
And then if you want to have a little bit more permit work and a little bit better pay, that four-year degree comes in. And then if you want to get even farther up, you typically are going to look at getting a master's degree in the management side of it all. If you want to work academically in, in, uh, and do research, then you're likely looking at getting a PhD, get going all the way up and getting the, the doctorate. Cool. And then were you a super awesome science and math person or in high school, I should say, kids always want to say they're not very good in science or math and so they can't do that job. So be honest now, kids want to know. <laughs> um, do you have to be a super awesome math and science individual to do wildlife work? No, but you need to enjoy doing science because it is it's a science it's a science field. You need to enjoy doing science. You need to enjoy research and, and asking questions and trying to find those answers. And there is typically a lot of math involved as well um, because that's how you can count and, and quantify and assess things. So there, there is math involved as well. Yeah, it is a relatively heavy math and science field. But I would not say that you have, it's not like you're a a quantum scientist or something like that, right? You're not a rocket scientist, but there's still a heavy math and science proponent to being a wildlife biologist. Awesome, that is a, thank you so much. Kids always ask me, oh, I'm not very good at science. And I think if it's something you enjoy and sometimes you have to get through a few steps to get to the, the part of the job you're passionate about. Yeah, and, and being good at science, like being good at anything takes practice and, and repeating and doing it multiple times. Nobody. Typically, people aren't good right off the bat at many or anything. It takes practice to get good at something. That's awesome. And that's the same for doing scientific work. And, yes. and so, you know, if you enjoy it, you don't have to be good at something to be enjoying it. You can still enjoy it, and then you get better at it as you do it more often. We tell kids that all the time because they get frustrated with some of the, you know, engineering design process. And often it's because they're not used to having to, like, ah, struggle, and science is hard sometimes. So. Uh, we do have some questions and comments coming in. Let me get, uh, I'm going to say hi to some of our followers. So hello, Debbie. She's our career specialist at West Valley High School, so I know she's super excited about uh, your talk today. And then Dan Wilson says science rules. And Dan, I couldn't believe, or agree any more with that. So, so uh, let's get started with some of the questions that we got um, from Facebook this week, if you'd be cool with answering those. Um, and this came from the Mule Deer Foundation. They would like to hear more about the shared habitat range and dietary similarities of sage grouse and mule deer explanation point. Mm -hmm. So yeah, sage grouse and mule deer actually overlap extensively across their range throughout the United States and in Washington. Um, typically mule deer have a little bit wider range than sage grouse because muleys can work outside of the sage brush. Sage brush is important to mule deer as well. But not as important to a mule deer as, as to a grouse. As you mentioned earlier, Jamie, sage grouse literally will become about 100% dependent on sagebrush dietarily in the winter time. And on top of that, they also depend heavily on sagebrush for cover in the winter time. Um, mule deer will eat sagebrush in the winter time, but they still also are going after it and digging down and getting into alfalfa and hay and, and, and working a wider dietary spectrum than a sage grouse would be. Um, but there are a lot of overlap there. They, they do also use the sagebrush step. That is their main habitat type for, for cover and, and uh, when they're in their breeding season and, and in the wintertime, they're, they're throughout that same area. So there is a wide, there is a very heavy overlap between mule deer and sage grouse. Um, but again, that mule deer does have a little bit of a wider range uh, as far as their habitat they can work in. The mule deer are a little bit more comfortable in some of our, our ag ag agricultural areas whereas our sage grouse don't usually venture too deep into wheat fields. Um, and the mule deer are, again, eating a little bit wider variety of vegetation, whereas sage grouse are really highly tied to sagebrush. And sage grouse will also eat insects, where mule deer don't typically delve into the insect realm too much. But again, high, high similarity between those two species in, in many of their uses and needs, habitat wise. And we here in Spokane, at least in the valley area, we have white-tailed deer. And so how is a mule deer different than a white-tailed deer? So uh, two different species. Um, so so there's, there's a difference there. <laughs> they are two different species. Um, white-tails tend to be a lot more uh, tied to riparian and forested areas. Um, they will venture out into that agriculture and the sagebrush a bit, but they're 
tend to be more of a forest and riparian tied species, as your mule deer tend to be more of that shrub step, high basin, and will be out in those ag fields a little bit out more in the open. Uh, very often your mule deer are comfortable being out in the open, uh, whereas your, your white tail doesn't typically get too far away from some cover where it can jump into pretty quick. Um, Dietarily speaking, they're real, actually relatively similar similar in their diet. They're both browsers. They like, you know, they're both veg, uh, eating vegetation. They're not, um, they're, they're, they're not very different as far as it goes to what they would actually like to eat. Cool. And then you... We but you don't typically sorry. find whitetail eating sagebrush, though. Okay. That is one difference definitely between them. They're, they will eat sagebrush. Okay, so I had a couple of thoughts. When you talk about uh, sage, sage grouse, what is a predator or something that could affect their ecosystem? And we talked about fire a little bit, which I think we'll talk about more, but uh, what would be a predator or what would be an impact that could negatively affect uh, grouse's uh, ecosystems? Well, as far as an immediate predator on sage grouse, probably anything that wants to eat a chicken <laughs> will also eat the sage grouse. <laughs> so our, our raptors, our bigger raptors will, will, will take sage grouse. Coyotes eat sage grouse, bobcats eat, eat sage grouse, humans eat sage grouse. Uh, so, so the sage grouse is not too high up in the pecking order as far as it goes. It's pretty low down there. It is, it is a prey item for a lot of other species. Okay. Um, as far as its ecosystem and what's threatening to sage grouse that way, that, that is predominantly human in threat there to them. Uh, they, we've had a large change of habit, large, large loss of sagebrush in Washington in particular to agricultural, uh, right? We, we've turned a lot of our sagebrush step into wheat production and agricultural production, um, which, you know, that, that's part of progress for us, but that's not so great for the birds. Um, they also have threats from other types of habitat loss, and that's typically in Washington what we're thinking about is fire there. Um, but in other states, the, the big concern is actually tree encroachment, particularly juniper encroachment in some of the other states uh, where sage grass exists. Those trees um, are, are creeping in, again, typically tied to humans reducing the fire regime, actually. Uh, that allows those trees to creep into the sagebrush ecosystem and, and, and kind of convert it more towards juniper forest instead of a sagebrush step. That's crazy. I never would have thought a tree would be negatively affecting an ecosystem. Yeah, yeah, they, they compete with the sagebrush itself and take up, you know, remove, you know, basically they're competing with the sagebrush for nutrients. And then on top of it, the juniper also acts as perching for raptors yeah. and, and that then also uh, directly predate on sage grass. Crazy. Okay, so, so along that line, how long does it take for sagebrush habitat to full, get fully established and for grouse to move in or back in? And then also the second part of that question is what other animals are found at Swanson's Lake? Ooh, that's, <laughs> so let me tackle the first one. Uh, so sagebrush is actually not the fastest growing plant. It, it's one of the problems we run into with it. it. It can take upwards of 10 to 20 years for sagebrush to really reestablish itself in an area once a fire has come through. Um, and, and a lot of that will tie down to precip. So if you if you get a lot of rain in an area, not a lot, but a, a decent amount of rain in, in, in some of the shrub step, that shrub, that sagebrush can grow back quicker. Um, but if you get, and so like in Washington, especially like in Lincoln County in there, we have actually a fairly good precip range there. Whereas you get farther south, especially down in Nevada where they have low precip, it can take a lot longer for sagebrush to come back in. Another thing that can affect sagebrush coming back in is, is how large the fire is. Right, if it's if it's a very large and very intense fire that removes almost all of the shrub, well, you need that seed source, right, for the sagebrush to grow back in. So the sagebrush coming in from the sides of that fire can start to recolonize the edges of the fire, but it might take decades for it to get back to the middle of the fire zone to actually start to reseed in there without some support or help from us. Um, as far as how long it takes for the birds to come back to sagebrush, um, that that's that's that. 15 to 20 year range in Nevada, sometimes 10 years here in Washington, where the sagebrush is actually big enough that it's actually supplying some cover and supplying some nesting cover for them and, some, and, and, and enough uh, forage for them. And then you still need birds, in essence, in the area to come back to it. And so that again comes back to how large that fire is and how much shrub step you have remaining and how those populations are doing. Um, other species we had at Swanson Lakes 
Um, and, and that's a wide variety, but we have the classic shrub step assemblage out there. Of, we have sage grouse. We got jackrabbits, typically our white-tailed jackrabbit out there. We have Colombian ground squirrels out there. We got mule deer. Um, we do have the Colombian sharp-tailed grouse out there as well. Actually, that first picture you showed with the sage grouse, the, the big bird on the top was the sage grouse. The two smaller looking birds, slightly different birds at the bottom were, were Colombian sharp-tailed grouse. They are another cool uh, grouse species out there, smaller uh, than the sage grouse. Uh, but they're also a, a lecking bird, so they come to the dancing grounds and dance in, in the springtime. Um, we have sage thrashers, uh, sage sparrows, uh, not too much, a lot of more vespers and brewers. We also have uh, some very, the, the scabland is actually really unique out here too in the sense of how much water. You have a lot of little coolies and ponds, and associated with them you get a, a wide waterfowl uh, assemblage that also will come through and, and use that area. Are you um, especially in the springtime as they're migrating back north, we get a large chunk of waterfowl using the wetlands and the, and the potholes out at Swanson Lakes and throughout the scablands. Well, and I know we talked yesterday, your picture that you're uh, projected in front of, that's actually Swanson Lakes, right? Yeah, that's a part of Swanson Lakes. It's it's uh, before the fire. Yeah. Um, so this it's green. Got, uh, like you said, you can kind of see it there if I move up. Yeah. See the coolies right yeah. there kind of in the back. That's a lot of the basalt cliffs and such that we have out there. Um, so if people haven't looked into the Missoula floods, that's a cool thing to check out. Um, uh, Moby has had some really good stuff on it. Uh, before, I don't know if they saw the same setup there to we show it, but do, the floods that came out of the Missoula uh, glacial lake were very intense and carved this whole this whole region and gave us these basalt cliffs and the plateaus and such. And it's 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 very, very interesting geology. Yeah, we talk a lot about the floods here, but we need to do a, a Missoula flood talk. Um, I have another question here. So you were talking about how it takes so long for it to, uh, I guess, come back to where it was. Okay, so I was wondering, when you hear about a fire, what does that do to your soul when you hear about that happening out there? I was just thinking about 20 years, right? Yeah, and, um, you know, fires always, you know, get your heart up in your mouth. And, and, and we've had a lot of fires come through there over the years that I've been here, um, but none of them have been as big as this last one. So typically, you know, the, a little bit smaller fires and, you know, a small scale fire, it, it hurts, but we can work to recover from it and, and the birds can recover from it. This one was a big fire. Uh, the Whitney Road fire was, was came whipping through there at 50 miles, it was dri driven by 50 mile an hour plus winds. Um, nothing that any of our firefighters could do to really stop that. Um, and so it, it covered a wide swath and it, it took out a lot of habitat. And so it, it, it does hurt. It hurts to go out there to see that moonscape that was following. Um, it also, though, it, 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 I can't share pictures, I'm sorry about that, but is, is that, um, you know, there's also growth that's coming back already. So it hurt a lot the, the, the weeks right afterwards, but literally within two to three weeks, there was still, there was actually green grass shoots starting to come back from some of the bunch grasses and, awesome. and some of our plantings were coming back. So th there is green light coming back out there at Swanson Lakes. If you get back out there in the springtime, it's going to look very different, I think, this coming spring than what it looked like this fall right after the fire. Um, so, so there is growth, life is coming back, but it, it definitely does hurt to see so much uh, loss. Okay, so I love questions. So first of all, Dan Wilson, said he noticed that there were spikes in the telephone poles when he went out to visit. Is that to stop predator, or predatory birds from perching and watching the grouse? Yeah, okay. Yeah, we, we, we've uh, worked with the local power company, uh, us and BLM and the power company to, to put up perch deterrents is what we, we call them. And yeah, that was to try to cut down on raptor perching in, in particular our great horned owls. They are a great animal, but they're also a very good predator and they are very good at taking our sage grouse. So they, they were, we were trying to reduce some of that perching habitat out there. Um, as you saw in some of the pictures of sagebrush, and you can see kind of behind me, there's not typically a lot of trees in sagebrush country. There's not a lot of tall structure in sagebrush country. And, and that tall structure, when we put it up, like windmills or power lines, they attract a lot of species, and they also detract a lot of species. There, there's actually responses from our birds from sage grouse and other uh, other prey species, when they see tall structures, they think, "Yeah, that's something a predator can perch on, and that predator is going to want to eat me." 
So we're going to try to maybe just try to avoid some of that that ground around those tall structures. And so yeah, we were trying to to, to kind of even that odds back out and, and reduce some of that perching for the rafters out there. Have you noticed an increase in their numbers based on that, or is that something you guys have asked that question? Um, <laughs> no, we, we we did not see it. We could not make a direct connection to the perch deterrence and any increase in the sage grouse in that area. Okay. Um, some of that is because of the sage grouse out at Lincoln County were a very small population to begin with. We actually started, the, the sage grouse was historically in throughout all of the Washington shrub step. It was extirpated from Lincoln County in the late 80s. In the, about 2008, we started actually trying to reintroduce sage grouse to Lincoln County. And the population that we had there uh, was is solely from the reintroduction effort. And so it's a relatively small population. And um, so being able to see changes in that uh, from some of our act activities, like the perch deterrence, is, is difficult to always tease out whether it's that that's maybe helping them or if it's not. It, it, it's, it's, a, it's a hard thing to try to really nail down as to what is, how, how big of an effect something's happened. Yeah. Uh, Stacy Lehman is asking, she knows that sage grouse dance, which I think we'll watch that video at, at the end here, but can they actually fly like other grouse species? They seem kind of big for that. They, they fly. They fly very well. They can fly actually fairly long distances. They do not typically fly to migrate like you see for waterfowl or geese. But they are they are very strong flyers, actually. That is their 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 first method for protection for a sage grouse is to hide. It's it's very much a, a, a camouflage bird. Um, outside of when they're dancing and they're big and puffed up, when they crouch back down, they become fairly small little brown brown blobs out there in the sagebrush. So their hiding in, is their big key defense. But right after that, if you still come near a sage grass, if it's like, oh, my hiding spot is shot, it'll fly faster than most other species are. You know, it, it's going to fly out of there quick and it'll scare the heck out of you. There's been more than more than a number of hikers that I've talked to that they've had almost a heart attack when a sage grouse was flying out from under its feet, their feet. Yeah, because they, they hide so hold. well. Yeah, yeah, that's awesome. They'll, they'll hold till you're almost right on top of them, and then they fly, and it's 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 scary. And they are a big birds, so that 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 wing flap and everything else is is very loud. Cool. Um. So with that being said, how if you were in downtown Spokane, how long would it take for somebody to come visit, uh, check it out, the habitat, Swanson's Lake? Lakes. To get out to Swanson Lakes proper, about an hour, hour and a half drive to get out there. Okay, cool. Um, and I've had people wonder about, are there going to be volunteering opportunities when you guys try to do uh, some, I guess, restoration work? Are you doing restoration work out after the fire? And will people, people be able to be part of that? Yes, we are. We're doing, we've done some work already. We'll be doing hopefully more work this coming fall, doing some plantings. Uh, some of that is uh, Melissa there with the with the outdoor learning center is working on some of that project as far as getting some seed, seedlings, save our seedlings, and, and getting a planting effort going. So there will be opportunities to help out with that. Um, and I would encourage people to contact. Uh, you can contact WDFW. I believe she, they can con contact you there, Jamie at yep. OLC. To, as far as for Melissa, you can also talk to the Spokane Audubon uh, Society. They are also doing a lot of work with us out there and are also looking at doing restoration projects as well. Yeah, we love to connect the community to anything that we can help with uh, habitats and critters here in Spokane. Um, Tina Penny, who's one of our awesome bird volunteers, she can't be on the call today. She's usually watching with us. She's up near Orville looking for her bucket list of owls, so she's obsessed. She wanted you to know that she is a heavy machine operator and can drive a tractor or a dump truck or anything you might need. So I want to give a shout out to Tina. Do we have any more questions? I'm going to play the video if we don't have any questions, okay? But I'm going to try to move you off of the center here. Oh, I guess I can do that. we got this cool smart board. Look at that. Look, at I'm moving him. <laughs> that is fun for me. Someday when we actually have kids, I'll get to do this. Should I click now? Well, I'm going to move him out of the way. Oh, that's right. <laughs> I'm going to minimize you. Not that you aren't important. That's fine. Oh, that, that, yeah, that, better that they get a big image and, and a, a good view of the dance.
and get you back now. Oh, look how techy I am right now. Mike, are you jealous of me? <laughs> I can't I can't see much of how you're doing that. <laughs> anyway, uh, will you tell us what we were witnessing in that video? And then we'll put that, put that video up on our Facebook page again so somebody can watch it again after they've seen, heard your explanation. What, what was going on there? So uh, one of the things that, and probably the, the thing that sage grouse and especially, uh, especially sage grouse, but also sharp-tailed grouse and our prairie grouse are known for is their their breeding grounds, which is called uh, you'll you'll hear the term lek or lekking grounds. That's their breeding grounds, and that's where the males come every spring, and they will dance. That was their dance there. You'll hear about the sage grouse dance, and and that's them inflating the air sacs and then deflating the air sacs. They got a wing movement that they're brushing up and down with their wings and making a, a swishing sound. Their tails are all flared up. And what those males are doing pretty much is showing off for the ladies. Uh, they are basically for dancing and strutting and trying to show that they're the strongest, most fit, best male out there. You will also fight with other males out there periodically. That, that, that'll evolve into fights between two males, uh, especially on the edge of their little territories. And, and they're all doing all this to basically impress the ladies. That, 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 the, the smaller bird that you saw kind of hunched down in, in throughout there without the big white chest and, and everything else, that, those are the females. And the females come to the lex and they check out those, those males and they pick which one they think is the best and and so that is their breeding system um and the males will be out there dancing from basically can be mid-february mid to late february all the way through to the end of april sage grouse here in washington will be dancing um and they dance usually very early in the morning but they'll also dance sometimes late at night and there's also some if you look out there there's sometimes where you'll see uh you'll see videos of people watching sage grouse dance in the middle of the night under a full moon because it's light enough um so so they will dance and dance and dance um that that dance there the other another cool little fact on that is so one of the most energy intensive things one of the things that takes the most energy out of any animal in the world is, is flying when they've done uh, energy uh, analyses on the sage grouse, that dance is actually almost as energetically expensive to a sage grouse as, dance, as flying would be. Wow. So it's a very highly energy expensive, it's a very expensive thing that these males are doing, they're building, putting a lot of energy into this, and so it takes a lot out of them every year. So it's actually also one of the highest mortality oh, time periods for males. They will, they, will, they will die at this time, most often from predators picking them off out, out of let, because when you have 20 or 30 of those birds dancing, they become a pretty obvious spot out there on the, on the landscape for an eagle to go check out. That's cool. So is that, would it be bad to try to go see that dance happening? Is that considered faux pas to go? Um, for Washington State, given that our sage grouse are actually threatened and potentially to be uplifted to endangered, it is probably not one of those things that is the best thing to go out there and, and over-advertise. There are leks that people do go watch. Um, I, I can't tell you where those are at, but it, you know that people do go to watch them. Um, we do do volunteer work with the department where people can sometimes go out and watch the birds as well for us and count them. Because that's actually one of the main times where we actually do our surveys. Because it's one of the easiest times to go out there and count how many males we have in an area. Awesome. Um, so there's potential for volunteering on that. But like I said, it, it's, it's uh, one, it's very, very early morning work. The birds dance typically at at first light, so about a half an hour to an hour before sunrise. And that means if you want to get close enough to be really close to get a video like this, you're talking about getting out there usually about two hours before sunrise, which again, when we said it's about an hour and a half out to Swanson, you're talking getting up really early or camping overnight out there. Um, and as far as Swanson goes, actually, our, our sage grouse, we only have one lek out there, and that was in the middle of the fire. So at this point for next year, there's probably not going to be a lot of volunteer opportunity because we don't know what we're going to be dealing with at this right. time. Somebody was asking, how are the lecking, or sorry, Jonathan Norman, how are lecking grounds chosen and established by the sage grouse? So there, there's several different theories out there as to what is the, the driving reason for where these leks appear. Uh, one of the most Common ones, and, and definitely is probably play, it plays a part in this. Is you need the right uh, nesting habitat in the in the relatively immediate vicinity. Typically, those females will nest within about one to three miles of the lek. Sometimes they'll nest they'll nest farther away, but typically those those hens are going to nest pretty close to the lek, which means your lek needs to have good sagebrush cover. 
to give those hens cover for those nests. So a large tie of it is going to be whether there's the right nesting uh, it, habitat in the vicinity. And then some of it comes down to a whole bunch of other micro kind of site factors like, okay, this side of the hill is exposed to early morning sunlight, which maybe is going to help them, but it's also maybe going to blind them to a, a golden eagle coming in. So they so they'll adjust the, their lex site on the micro topography as to whether or not they feel greater or, or less safety from predators. Um, some of it's the ability to be seen on the lek, right? It, it, that, that, that display is not very visible if you have a lot of shrub around it. So leks are almost always fairly open habitat. So you need a relatively open space with sagebrush nearby for nesting um, for the males to be able to display on. So a lot of things will come in together to, to dictate where a lek will show up. That is awesome. This is all new learning for me. So thank you for the people asking the questions. Um, Dan Wilson, a really good question. As an expert like you are, what's a good binocular to get that you would watch, build to watch from afar? Who are you sponsored by? <laughs> <laughs> not, not sponsored by anybody, but um, I, I would say actually for, for, for doing sage grouse lek viewing or any lek viewing safely, for the birds, for the minimum disturbance, you're actually likely going to be looking more at getting a spotting scope, not not a pair of binos, but a good high-powered scope. Be able to sit back, you know, quarter mile from the left and watch, because otherwise, really bino-wise, you need to be pretty much in a blind right up against the left um, to get a good view. Um, so you're more likely looking at getting a, a good powered scope that you can sit on a little bit of a rise, a quarter mile away, and, and get a view of the bird that way. Um, and, and then as far as the scope power goes, I mean, there, there's a whole wide variety that you can look into out there. And I, I don't I don't want to go into try to go into details as to what might be best. That's awesome. No, good advice. Thank you. Uh, is there anything else that we've missed that you want our watchers to know? Um, I think we've covered a lot, a lot of ground. I mean, they are a cool bird and there's always more details to go into on, on every part of what we talked about. Right. There's there's. We, we, we've brushed the surface of a, of a lot of topics, and you can always dive deeper into any of those. Cool. Well, I really appreciate Mike being here. Um, for me to learn stuff from an expert like you, I'm looking at the computer screen that you're on right now. Mm -hmm. uh, anyway, it's really fascinating for, for us here. We appreciate your time um, in this crazy time of education. It's fun for us to get to meet an expert in the field. Um, if you're watching this on the replay, just know that Mike and I and Melissa and Tiffany and Lily are here to answer questions. So if you're watching this on our YouTube channel after the live show or you're watching it on the Facebook live replay, make sure you ask questions um, or make comments. We'd love to share those stuff with Mike and we really appreciate you being here, Mike, and um, doing what you do for, for our world. Thank you. So I'm going to say goodbye. Thank you. It was a pleasure. Thank you.